you got your Bible, open it to Genesis chapter 22 this morning, and for time's sake, we're going to need to move quickly, so I want you to follow along, track with me. We're going to hit hard and fast this morning. Genesis chapter 22, verse 1 says this, it says, after these things, God tested Abraham, and he said to him, Abraham, Abraham said, here I am. I hope you're aware that in your life, part of the process of God making you into the image of His Son, Jesus, God training you to trust Him in everything for the rest of your life, in fact, God prepping you for heaven itself, I hope you're aware that an essential part of that is testing. That's how God refines us. That's how God reveals us and what's really in our hearts. He's going to test us. Well, the passage says this. It says, after these things. What are these things? Let me give you a quick run, uh, run through of what brings us up to this part of the story in Abraham's life. Um, A huge, pivotal moment, not just in Abraham's life story, not in just biblical history, but really in the history of the world. I mean, this this is a pivotal moment in God's work towards restoring and redeeming humanity. So here's what's happened. God has made Abraham three great promises, right? Right? Genesis chapter 12, he promises him that he's going to give him the land that is forever and ever his. We're seeing that battled over, contested today. He's made him a promise to be a great nation, and he's promised him something spiritual that's even greater than those first two promises, that through you, all the people of the earth are going to be blessed. The seed that I'm going to give you, of course, we know that seed. If we read Matthew chapter 1, we see that seed coming all the way through to the person of Jesus Christ himself, and this all begins in that great promise he makes to Abraham problem is this, Abraham and Sarah are growing old, and there is no sign on the horizon of any possible way this promise is going to be fulfilled. In fact, the scripture is pretty explicit about this. Not only are they old, the Bible says that Sarah is barren, and on top of that, they're not even sexually active anymore. So, so how is this going to be? And so Abraham begins to offer God some assistance on the promise that he's made. Okay, God, I know you made this great miraculous promise. Let me give you a, a hand here. Let me help you out a little bit, God, just in case you need me. Here's what we can do. I got Eleazar. We can just pretend like he's my son. I mean, he would be my heir technically, legally anyway. Why don't we just call Eleazar my son, and then we're good to go, right? It'll be through him. Of course, God refused that, and he's got Sarah pressing, pressing, pressing the issue. And she gives some more bad counsel and says to him, well, you know, I've got Hagar, my, my maidservant. Once you have relations with Hagar, you have a kid technically, again, legally, not ethically, not morally even then. Would it be acceptable? But ethically, I mean, but legally, that would be your heir. So you can have a child there. And so Abraham compromises. Abraham demonstrates a lack of faith in God's promise, a lack of willingness to wait on the timetable of God. He does God's will his way, and he has a child with Hagar named Ishmael. Big mistake. The birth of Ishmael would create a new nation. A new great nation, not necessarily great in how we would measure greatness, but great in how we might number them, many, many, many. And they would forever be in conflict with God's people and still are today. Ishmael is born, but it's not a miraculous birth. Nothing about Ishmael's birth says, wow, God, you're awesome. Wow, God, you're a promise-keeping God. Wow, God, look at the supernatural way you interceded here in the natural events of the world. No, no, no. Everything about Ishmael's birth is straight-up man-made. Then, 13 years later, Lo and behold, to everyone's shock and surprise, the promised one, the pre-named one, the one that the messenger of God had told them to call Isaac, is born. We fast forward to a dedication service of sorts, a celebration for Isaac, and we see Ishmael, just like uh, 13-year-olds do, no offense to 13-year-olds sitting here, but he's a little bit of a punk and he's making fun, mocking his little brother. There apparently is a little bit more beneath the surface there of his animosity towards the one that now is going to usurp him, supplant him, right? Sarah catches wind of this. She sees this, and she is greatly offended by this. She has this raging animosity towards Hagar and jealousy towards Ishmael for the sake of her own son, and so now she implores Abraham, put them out, kick them out, get them out of here. Scripture says that Ishmael become very, very dear to Abraham because Abraham for 13 years had assumed this was the fulfillment of God's promise. This was his son, this was his heir now, and his whole heart was vested in Ishmael, but reluctantly he sends him out. 
Apparently, according to Genesis chapter 1, he doesn't send them out with very much, however. Enough food, enough water to barely get them through, because it's not very long in the story that we see Hagar with young Ishmael, and perhaps because he's 13, he's not a child anymore, perhaps he's so ill, so sickly now because of lack of food and water, she puts him under a tree. The Bible says she goes far enough away, it's the distance that you could shoot an arrow, because she doesn't want to see him die. She doesn't want to watch him die. God himself appears. And reminds them that he had promised something for Ishmael too. Provides miraculously a water, a well. And he delivers them both. Ishmael becomes this wanderer in the wilderness. Ishmael Ishmael becomes this this great hunter, wanderer, nomad, outcast. Now only Isaac remains. Young Isaac. Little Isaac. It's all old Abraham has left. I mean, if God is going to do what God has promised that he's going to do, this incredible, epic promise that would change the world, literally, it's going to be through this little guy right here, Isaac. And then you come to this, well, let's call it for what it is. It's a shocking chapter. It's one of those chapters that people who have not been to church and catch wind of or read it say, what kind of God is this? What in the world does God expect? Is this the sort of God you believe in? I mean, I don't get this story at all. Let's read Genesis chapter 22, this first portion, and see what God is showing to us in it today. And also, as we read it, there's a shadow being cast of a much bigger story. And we'll see that at the end. After these things, God tested Abraham, and he said to him, Abraham, Abraham said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, Go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Listen, this is not like Aesop's fables, okay? It's not a fairy tale. This is a real God talking to the real man that he had chosen to fulfill the real promises that he'd given him. And he's telling him, as a hundred plus year old man, take the only kid you've got the only way this is ever going to happen, and I want you to sacrifice him. Listen, we can do all the mental gymnastics we want today and try to make it like, well, that was different then. People thought differently, acted differently. No, this is a man and his only son. Many things will change, but the love of a father for his son don't. Verse 3, Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering. And he arose and he went to the place of which God had told him. It's it's amazing what Abraham is doing here. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes. He saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. I want to underline that. There's a... There's an evidence of a sort of faith here that runs deep. God has told him to do something that is not just incredible, it's incredulous. It's, 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 dare I say, appalling. And, And yet there's this faith because he knows the character and nature of God. He knows where God has taken him. He knows how God has demonstrated himself over the years. This God is no longer a stranger to Abraham. This is not the God that appeared and called him out of Ur in Genesis chapter 12. This is the God who has done the amazing for him again and again. He says, we'll come back. Verse 6, Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering, laid it on Isaac his son. Isaac is carrying, he's bearing the wood that will bring his own death. Think about that for a moment. He took in his hand the fire and the knife, and both of them went together. Isaac said to his father Abraham, my father. He said, here I am, my son. He said, behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? I don't understand, dad. We got everything for a sacrifice, but we have nothing to sacrifice. Abraham said, God will provide. God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went, both of them together. And when they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there, laid the wood in order, and bound Isaac, his son. Laid him on the altar, on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife 
to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. He said, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son for me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, and behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his thorns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord, it will be provided. An angel of the Lord called Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Authentic faith is always tested faith. If it's real, it's going to be legitimized through the process of testing. And you need to know that without obedience, there is no real faith. You can't say, oh, I believe in God. You know, I've got faith in God. I trust Him. All these incredible songs that we sing about the goodness and nature and power and the great I am-ness of God and then say, I'm not going to do what He says. No, no, that's not faith. That's a joke. That's a blasphemy. And let me add a third statement there. God always blesses faith that is displayed in obedience. He blesses that sort of faith that shows up in what we do. It's as James said in his great epistle. James says this, he says, you, you show me your faith. In other words, you talk about what you say you believe about God. I'll show you my faith by what I do. How about that? He's not elevating works over faith. He's saying those two must coexist or they don't. They don't exist at all. How does this test challenge you and me? I mean, what does this look like for you and me? Because here's what I'm thinking as I'm reading that again this morning and reading that passage aloud. I'm thinking, boy, most of us in this room, no, no, let's say this. All of us in this room have spoken or unspoken limitations on how far we will go with our obedience to God. And I would say for every single person in a seat in this room and every person standing in this room today, it falls far short of ever picking up a knife and sacrificing our only son. And how far would you go? And how great and deep is your trust? And what you cannot possibly fathom, what you cannot possibly understand, how deep is your trust in this God? Because this is an epic test of radical obedience. This is not the simple stuff of read your Bible go to church, give an offering, be a good person. No, come on, let's get serious here. This is where you lay it all out there, give it all up, only because you trust me to know better and to do good. How, how does this test of Abraham test me and you? Here's a question I've got for all of us. Do you love God more? Do you love God more? Maybe I should put it this way to be grammatically correct. In all the competitions for the affections of your life, do you love God most? He says to Abram, do you, he says, take your son, your only son Isaac, and he points this out, whom you love. I know the affections you got for Isaac. I know the affections of a father for his only son. He says, take this one that you love. All of Abraham's life this, thus far has been marked by a series of sacrifices of things that he had great affection for. The challenge to give up things that were, that were priorities and applauded priorities, the sort of thing that make you a good person in the eyes of others. I want you to give up your homeland. I want, to give, I want you to give up that soil in which you were raised. And I want you to leave your brothers and your sisters and your father and your mother. I want you to leave your kinsfolk, that family you have prioritized. Later on, he would be challenged to Give up his nephew Lot, whom he presumably loved like a son that he took with him for this journey. He had to abandon, in chapter 17, his cherished Ishmael. 
He had to turn everything over again and again. And now, now, now the pinnacle of all this, that none of those things compare to, easy to leave country because God had given him another. Easy to leave family because now God has blessed him. But Isaac? What if God perceives? What if God perceives there is one thing in your life that he knows and that you know supersedes your affections for him? Like the rich young ruler, if the tension ever really came to you've got to choose one or the other, you've got to follow me or latch hold of this, you will not let go of it and follow Christ. What if there's that one thing, whatever it is, that competes with him for allegiance and affection, your Isaac, what if there's that one thing and God challenges you at that point, is there anything in your life you value more than God? Because I bring you back to a central theme of Scripture here. And when I say a central theme, I mean Old Testament Scripture or New Testament Scripture. What ultimately does God want from any of us? What does He want? Well, what's God after? What's the deal? What's God want? He wants our hearts. Proverbs 23, 26. Give me your heart, my son. Give me your heart. I don't need your stuff. I don't need all your... Religious activity. These are sacrifices. I want your heart. I want you to love me with everything that you are. Your heart. Your soul. Your strength. Your mind. I want your love. Give me your heart. Second question I have that challenges me is this. Do I have to understand everything God says in order to obey it? Man, we, we live in the age today of qualifying our obedience and examining and, and trying, to, you know, trying to make everything sort of only culturally specific. Well, that doesn't apply to us today. You know, God, God's not really asking that of us today. That, that's not literal. That's just sort of figurative. Do you have to understand everything God says in order for you to obey Him? If you do, He's not much of a father. And you don't have much faith. If the only things that you obey, the only things that you do are the things that you understand or the things that you can see a good outcome for your sake on the other side of, that's not faith at all. And without faith, you can't please Him, the Bible says. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. That's not my quote. That's His quote. And the essence of the unknowableness of God, whose ways are not our ways, whose thoughts are not our thoughts, who is so much higher than us that we cannot even comprehend the distance between us us the creatures from dirt and dust god the ever existing creator do i have to understand his mind to obey his will can i not trust his heart for me even when i can't see what it's going to do this is the ultimate challenge and i see this in in hebrews chapter 11 this Reminder, this accounting again through the lens of faith of what Abraham did. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, he offered up Isaac. I mean, he did. You see it. He loaded up the donkey. He gathered the firewood. He built the fire. He carried the knife. He tied up the sun. And he who received the promises, Abraham, was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He was going to do it when he knew this would end it. Do you see that? He didn't, there's no way he could have understood this. Do you trust God without reservation? Do you trust Him without reservation? Again, we understand Abraham's story and his heart so much better in hindsight, looking through the lens of Hebrews, because Hebrews 11.19 says, Abraham considered that God was able even to to raise him from the dead. From which, figuratively speaking, he did raise him back. Think about this just for a moment. Jeremy talked to you last week about the miraculous power of God. God wants us to believe and trust in him to be able to do things we can't see, can't imagine, and can't do on our own. When you wonder how Abraham could go that far, take that trip, and it wasn't a farce, it wasn't a sham, it wasn't a show... He obviously was not going to obfuscate at the end and pull the knife back and say, okay, God, I got this close. Come on. Come on. Am I being punked here? Game over. Game over, God. Really, what what did you mean here? This really is spiritual, right? 
You don't want to be like spiritually sacrificed, like, okay, God, I offer him up to you. Um, Isaac is yours. Do with him what you will. Okay, Isaac, let's go home now. He was willing to do this because he trusted that, you know what, if God is calling me to kill my son, and God has promised that through my son is going to be a great nation and a great people and a great promise, then that he must be planning on bringing him back from the dead. I mean, you wrestle with that in your own mind. That's just profound to me. I, then I guess God is going to bring him back from the dead. That's trusting God without reservation. Now, that's pretty different than the sort of trust Abraham has exemplified up to this point. Wouldn't you agree? There's a big difference in the Abraham of Genesis chapter 22 and the Abraham of Genesis chapter 12. Because before it was trust with conditions. Before it was trust with manipulation. Before it was trust with personal assistance. God, I'm, I'm going I'm to assist you on this. I'll help you get this right. I'll do this for you. Now, none of that is there. Now, this is trust with radical and reckless abandonment. It's all you, God. Will you do whatever God says? Will you do whatever God says? End of chapter, I mean, the end of verse 12 in chapter 22 says, Now I know. God speaks to him and says, Now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld. Now I know. Now I know. Now I know what kind of follower I've got. I want you to hear this. It's not until God tests the limits of our faith and our obedience that he knows what kind of follower he's got. You hear what I'm saying? It's not until he tests the limits of it, until he knows what kind of follower he's got. And at the same time, it's not until we obey in the extreme. It's not until we follow by faith in that which we cannot see or know or understand do we know what kind of God we've got. Because part of our problem in not believing the miraculous is we shortchange God from doing the miraculous. Part of our problem in not obeying what he says to do is we never get to see him at work on our behalf because we take it all into our own hands. We figure out our way around his word and what he actually says, and we do it ourselves, and we wonder, where is God? God doesn't seem real to me. No, because you shut God out of the equation altogether. I think of this in Deuteronomy chapter 8 regarding the children of Israel when they're coming out of Egypt. The same principle applies. He says, I did all of these things to test you to see what was in your heart to see what's in your heart. Some of the hard things that are in your life right now are designed by God to see what's in your heart. To see if you'll obey Him or not. Will you obey Him when it's hard? Would you obey Him when it's costly? Would you obey Him when it costs everything? See, these, these next few questions really are so defining for me in the course of the rest of my life, in Abraham's life, in your life. What will you do if God commands you to do something you absolutely don't want to do? What will you do? I mean, can you see how that will dictate the course of your life? What will you do when God tells you to do something you don't want to do? Will you do it? Because you trust Him? Because you know He loves you? Because you know He sees what you can't see? What will you do when God calls you to give up something you absolutely want to keep? Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's a habit. Whatever it may be, and God says, this cannot be part of you. Let it go. Sacrifice this to my will, to something greater. What will you do when you want to hold it so badly? And God says, don't. And what will you do as you're reading through the Scriptures? And God gives you a command, but because He's God and you're not, He doesn't tell you why He gives you the command. Will you obey him even when you don't understand? Like a father to a child, I don't have to give you every reason for what I tell you to do. Trust me. No, I know what you don't. See what you can't. And want for you as much as you want for yourself, if not more, you're good. How are you going to handle this test of obedience? Like Abraham, will you obey? And I chose this word today intentionally, not to choose a tricky word because it so fits, without equivocation. Equivocation. 
You know, trying to use ambiguous language to sort of conceal your real purposes or, or to try to weasel your way out or, or to find sort of a loophole. Abraham was a good loophole finder for a long time, but not anymore. Yes, God, I'll obey you. And then Ishmael? No, no, no. Yes, God, I'll obey you and go to the promised land and head to Egypt? No, no, no. Do what I say without weaseling or way around it. Will you do it without reservation? Will you do it without hesitation? Listen, you, you may read this story today. Again, maybe it's the first time you've heard it read through Genesis 22, I don't know. It's such a pinnacle event in the history of Israel and therefore our history that I hope you're familiar with it to some degree. If not, I, I'm glad you became somewhat familiar with it today. But you may read that story and your thought may be this. i got to be honest with you, Paul, that story, that offends me. That's not the way I see God, you know. That's not my version of God. How could God ask this of Abraham? I, I don't get this. How could a loving God ask this of Abraham? And maybe, just maybe, as you read this story, if you're spiritually sensitive to its contents, maybe there's a part of you that is a little bit afraid when you read this sort of a story. I mean, what if God asked me to do something like that? So now we're trying to reconcile this to our own way of thinking, our own picture of God, our own understanding of everything. And it doesn't fit. You know, maybe... Maybe we were meant to be appalled by this story. Maybe this story was meant to be a gut punch to our fragile sensitivities and our weak assessments of God and our own designs of who God is. Maybe that's the whole intent of the story. Perhaps it's not until we feel some outrage over this. A man and a small boy and a sacrifice that we can begin to feel an appropriate sense of wonder for what this story actually foreshadows. Maybe little by little, our outrage at reading this story will shift towards adoration of what the story really reminds us. Maybe our offense will give way to worship. Maybe, maybe our confusion will give way to embracing the God who gives us the story for a greater purpose than a moral lesson, than just a moral tale. Maybe instead of wondering, would God ever ask the unthinkable of me? Maybe we look at the story and we begin to realize, wait a minute, wait a minute. This story is the foreshadowing of the God who has done the unthinkable for me. Maybe there's something much bigger here. Why would God ask Abraham to offer his son as a sacrifice? Is God asking each of us to take our oldest or our only and sacrifice them? Is he, is he trying to tell us that really the story is about whatever is most precious you give up today? Is that really the ultimate point of the story or something more? You see, I don't think ultimately the purpose of the story is to inspire us to sacrifice to God the most precious thing that we have. But I think the ultimate point of the story is to show us the God who has sacrificed for us the most precious thing He had. And I think we're meant to recoil at that until we see that, wait a minute, wait a minute. This is what God has done for me. God was willing to sacrifice Jesus for me. Look at the clear foreshadowing of this in verse 7 and 8. Isaac looks to his father, my father. It's as if Jesus on the cross saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? My, my father, he said, here am I, my son. He said, behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb? And Abraham says the most profound thing in this entire event. God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. What God has required of all of us, a payment, a righteous payment, a righteously justifiable payment for our sins is what God demands because He is holy. The wages of sin is death. And what God has demanded of us, a blood penalty, He provides for Himself a sacrifice. At great cost to Himself, the sacrifice. It's, it's God. 
We cannot offer anything as precious in magnitude as what God has offered for us. And so we think about this awfulness of why would God call Abraham to sacrifice his son? Why would God sacrifice his own son on a cross? And then all of a sudden, when God begins to capture our heart and change our thinking, the whole thing begins to turn and we stand in amazement at what God has done for us. We say, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I should have died for my sins. I deserve that. But Jesus is the Lamb of God sacrificed for me that God provided for me. The imagery is far too vast for me to go into in any detail today. Time would not permit. There are at least 30 parallels of Isaac, uh, Isaac and Jesus that are crystal clear in Scripture. Of all the births in the Bible, Isaac is spoken of, the prophecy of, more than any other by far, save Jesus. He's given a name before he's born and what that name means. He's a progenitor of a family, a people of faith, a people of God's own choosing. He sacrificed on Mount Moriah, where later the temple would be built, where temple sacrifices were made, of which Jesus finally says, I am the ultimate, the last sacrifice. And just as God provided a sacrifice then, He does it now. Romans 3.21, in a modern paraphrase or modern translation, says this, but now, God has shown us a way to be made right with Him without keeping the requirements of the law as was promised in the writings of Moses and the prophets long ago. If you're perfect, you don't need Christ. I shared the gospel with someone this week and we talked about that. What about the law and all the commands? Listen, if you could keep all the commands, you would not need Christ. Like the rich young ruler who thought he was keeping them all from his birth. That's what he proudly proclaimed before Jesus who knew his heart. He said, I've done all that. Jesus said, okay, great. You've kept all the commands since you were young. Do this one for me. I want you to take everything you have. I want you to sell it, give it to the poor, and then you come back and follow me. I'm paraphrasing, as you know, because the Bible doesn't have terms like this, but he said, whoa, what's up, God? That didn't work. No way. He went away very sad because he had a lot of stuff. What does Jesus say to that man? People say, well, does that mean rich people can't get into heaven? No. Jesus wasn't challenging his possessions. He was challenging his beliefs. He said, I've kept the commandments since I was a kid, all of them. And Jesus said, wait up, wait up. You haven't even kept commandment number one. You shall have no other gods before me. You think you've kept them all? You haven't even kept the first one. Go back to school, kid. You need the gospel. We all do. But God has shown us a way to be made right with Him. Verse 22, we are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. And yet God, with undeserved kindness, declares that we are righteous. He did this through Christ Jesus when He freed us from the penalty for our sins. And here's your parallel from Genesis chapter 22, verses 7 and 8. It's Jesus. For God presented Jesus as a sacrifice for sin. God presented Jesus. God pre presented that lamb for his own sake, for Isaac. And God presents Jesus for our sake. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. This sacrifice shows that God was being fair when he held back and did not punish those who sinned in times past. For he was looking ahead and including them and in what he would do in the present time. All sins punished in Christ. God did this to demonstrate his righteousness. What does that mean? He's just. He's good. He's holy. He does not condone sin. He does not accept sin. He punishes sin righteously. For He Himself is fair and just. And He declares sinners to be right in His sight when they believe in Jesus. For He is our sacrifice. He is the Lamb that was slain. What about you today? God has demanded of you righteousness. Righteousness. Perfect and holy, without blemish, without spot, without flaw, without error, without misstep, without mistake as we call sin. He's demanded that of you. Can you provide it? Can you provide it? Can you honestly say you can provide it? If not, then you need a sacrifice. You need a substitute. You need someone who can and someone who has, and that's Jesus. And if you'll put your faith and trust in Him, that Lamb that God provides as a sacrifice for your sins and mine 
will be acceptable to God. And his view of you will be his view of his son. Listen, this is a challenging passage. For some of us, it causes us today to consider what's of most value to us. Is it God or something else? For others of us, it causes us to consider what are the limitations of our obedience? And how much can I really say I trust God? How far will that really go? And for others of us still, it's a challenge to consider where we're going to spend forever. Because we either stand before God on our own or on Christ. I choose Christ. And I hope you will. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes with me this morning. It's all over this room and just quiet. I want us to pray together. Listen, there are many levels of potential response today. and The Spirit of God is in charge of those and you've got to be obedient to those. So I'll leave that between you and God. But what if God is saying to some of you, listen, you're, you proclaim faith, okay? You self-identify as Christian. Well, how can you say you have faith when you don't do what I say? Because faith is not borne out in songs. It is not borne out in uh, lengthy proclamations of belief, clever constructions of religious systems. Faith is borne out in daily obedience. Do you do what God says? Because that says that you trust Him. James is a bit more emphatic than I. He says faith without works is dead. Faith without works, he says, saves no one. It's not real. It's not alive. It's not true. It's not legit. So what about you? What does your faith bear out? And works. Some of you today need to be challenged on the point of your priorities. You love God, but honestly, you're afraid. You're afraid to jump in all the way because you don't know what He might ask of you. Listen, I've been there. Okay, God, if I follow you into ministry, are you going to send me someplace I don't want to go? I don't want to go to New Guinea. I heard they kill people there. I don't want to, I, I, you know, I, I don't want to go where. I'm in danger or I'm, a, I'm threatened or whatever. I, you know, we're afraid. I don't know. We're afraid. Why? Because we don't know God. We don't trust Him enough yet. It took Abraham a while to learn that God was totally trustworthy and totally good and God is working out things for His glory and that's for our sake. It's for our good as well. They coincide. It takes a while sometimes for us to see that. Abraham finally did trust Him. You can trust Him. What's God telling you to do? You've got to do it. You can trust Him. But finally, for some of us, this is about something much bigger than the daily activity of trust even, because we're not ready for that yet. It's about our very salvation. God has provided for us what He requires. He requires a payment for our sin. Will you accept it? We accept it as a payment for your sin? I hope this makes crystal clear sense to you today. We are all guilty of sinning. All have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. That's not a joke. That's not a, that's not a religious idea. That's not a churchy thing. That's as real as real gets. And God is just. He's not like any human judge. God will handle sin righteously and justly according to His character. So sin will be punished. And this makes the issue of salvation pretty clear cut. I will be punished for my sins forever in a hellish separation from God. Everlasting conscious torment. Or I will be forgiven of my sin and treated as the very sinless, spotless Lamb of God, the Son of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Not because I earned Him. Not because I've turned my life around and become such a good guy, but because I have believed in Him and trusted Him for it. And like a gift, a sacrifice He provides, I accept it as mine. So have you? Have you? One or the other. That's it. His sacrifice or yours. The demands of God are provided by the goodness of God, and I hope you'll accept it today. I hope you'll accept His goodness.